But if anything remains of that building, we haven't discovered it. Um, when you go down the cellar, if you go down the cellar, do the other ladies down the cellar? Not yet. Not yet. No, Not they yet. will be next year. Oh! Um, so, you know, it's good because it's really interesting down there. Um, when you go down the cellar, you can see there's a difference in the wall as you go, go down. And my impression was that this was earlier. I also thought that the windows, which look out onto, would have looked out onto what we call an area, you know, the bit in front of the Georgian houses is called an area, not because it's a space, but because it was airy. <laughs> it's sometimes called the airy. Um, but they, my distinct impression was that it was such a big grand window that that was ground level. Now, very often, especially with Georgian buildings, why dig down when what you can do is a bought for a Vorty Street in front? So that's what Royal Crescent, for example, what are now the basements, started out at ground level, and then they slapped the vaulted terrace. So you've got cellars underneath the, the road, and what was the at ground level now becomes the basement. And I felt that this was, that's what I was looking at. So I was very relieved find that Peter Davenport, who's a very respected archaeologist, uh, a friend of mine, um, in his report on this, thought exactly the same, because he's got all the qualifications, and I'm, I'm just the one whose family, my grandfather's, maternal grandfather's family were builders, so whenever, and he used to trot my mum on around Portsmouth, pointing out all sorts of things. But she did that with me, and that's how I come to look at buildings. I'm just used to looking at buildings. <laughs> So, we're pretty certain it goes back to at least the 16th century, it could even be earlier. When you go downstairs, as you come, th you go down through the door, you will see there's a wooden beam, and, and a timber beam, and that, for a whole variety of reasons, I think is 16th century. Not least the chamfer on the end, it's what we call a stop, um, because it's very typical. Um, and I should say, first of all, we don't know about when this really dates back to if there's anything left of the 13th century one. But right opposite, on the white bed, once upon a time, was Bath's oldest known pub, which dates back to the 13th century, John Wissey's Tavern. <laughs> I don't think there's anything left. Um, and behind this one was a little chapel called St Michael's Within. And it's now the St. Michael's Centre, although it's very much altered. If that too was a pub at one time, the Queen's Head. After the chapel became um, sort of ruinous in the Middle Ages, it became uh, a little shop and which sold drink. Mm. Um, and it was five foot by five foot and a half. That's mm. under two meters. <laughs> and somebody was had up. The owner was had up for selling drink. And people playing billiards on a Sunday. Oh, how are you saying that? It's a grandmother's bottle that's looking out the window. Honestly, that's true. And that became a pub called the Checkers. And then they pulled it down, and there was this building built on it. Um, and they said, amongst other things, it wasn't to sell alcohol. And we probably got a license and started selling alcohol. So there's a lot of drinking going on around here. Um, now, <laughs> my building is constantly altering. I mean, this is one of the problems I have with listed buildings. I mean, I do research for them, <coughs> and I do think sometimes that English, uh, historic England, of course, is something that is being a bit silly. Mm. Because buildings have always changed, and as long as you do it in the right way and conserve the important things, I see. Um, but you can improve it. People, have got, a building has got to work for its living. Otherwise, it might just as well be pulled down. If it's not doing anything, it might just as well go. Um, I mean, it could be a tourist attraction. That's fine. Um, but you know. Anyway, so sometime in the 17th century, we know that a he's believed to be the surgeon. He was from Germany, um, called John Ostendorf moved in here in 1637. And it's believed that he did this amazing ceiling. It's been altered in the 18th century. You can see how they put this grand cornice in. And I will explain why in a moment. It's because the builders made a mistake. <laughs> um, so you can see it sort of disappears. This, this should really go properly. 
bit out of there. And as I say, he was from Germany. And we think this may explain, if you look up here, the shields, they have got the double-headed eagle of oh. Of the Austrian Empire. And so um, the other odd thing it's got is what appear to be Native American workers. Yeah. Mm. There's, there's several of those. Um, and one theory might be because he was a doctor that they used tobacco for some quite interesting purposes, which I won't go into here. Um, but anyway, uh, so the, the, I mean, like, this is just such an extraordinary thing. And it never used to be seen. And then in the 1990s, oh, I don't know, it was when Bass was trying to close the star. And um, so my son used to go to the star, and he said, what can we do to support it? Um, and so that was the very first Great Bath Pub Call. I did it for Bath Festival. And my son, who was a guide on the over-the-top buses in his holidays, when he wasn't at uni, did the tour. And we ended up at the star. Uh, but we came in here and talked to the then landlord, and he said, oh yes, there's this wonderful scene, he'd done a bit of his history. And he agreed to keep the window, the curtains open at night. Mm -hmm. uh, and that went on for a long time, you know, kind of had it, and then within the very most recent years, the landlord's gone, mm -hmm. closed the curtains, mm -hmm. you couldn't see him, I have no idea why. But anyway, oh, so Oh, I can tell thanks. you that later. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> thanks to uh, Stephen Walker. Um, it is Peter Davenport's opinion that Ostendorf didn't do this straight away. He thinks it's post-1650. Um, and after he died, his wife certainly was here. And it seems to have been um, a lodging. So there's lots of other remains in here. Some of this, you, unless you come and stay here when, when it's going to be a B&B. &B. Um, but there, it's the staircase. Um, you, can, you can see where there are the dark boards. Mm -hmm. They're the original boards. You can see by the width of them how yeah. old they are. We've got 18th century panelling, but up on the floor above, we've also got 17th century panelling. Part way up the staircase, there's like a gate, and I'm pretty certain that's a dock gate. And when you get to the top, because you've got this very nice sort of 18th century handrail, when you get to the top, it's something very plain, and I've seen that before in a number of 17th century houses. So this is a real kind of mishmash of history. And in 1697, we know this was Ms. Plocock's lodgings, and it looked like that. <laughs> now, what do we mean by Ms.? I know Emily's been told it's Mr. It isn't Mr., it's Ms. Now, this is on the edge of Gilmore's map. You know that map I showed you? All the way around the edge are lodging houses. Pictures of them. There are only two that said Ms. The other one was across the road, Ms. Toop's lodging. And I checked that out, and in 1697, that was certainly being run by a woman. So next time, any of you ladies who like me use Ms. I told her, oh, these modern things, so no, 300 years old. <laughs> 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 um, they, people who tell you what to do just hate being told that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's what it looked like. And there were gables on the side, and, and when Ellie took me up to the top room, there's these very strange things coming down into the ceiling, and I said, it's the remains of the gables. Um, coming down, we worked out from the drawings, that's what it must have been. So um, that's uh, Miss Pocock's lodging. So we know then it was a lodging house. And at some time in the early 18th century, they refronted it, at which point, I mean, I'm, refronting was quite common. Um, I went on a course at the Jeffrey Museum in London, and they explained how it was usually done, which was they usually put up scaffolding, put it through pinning the building, taking down the old front, Put out, especially the Georgians were really keen on doing this. At a uh, house along from Sally Nuns, um, at number two, um, I've been in there and done quite a lot of stuff with, with them and looked at stuff. And what they seemed to do with it, because it got a, what looks like a Georgian front, and they kind of slapped it right onto the front of the old one. So when you look at the windows, you can see where, in order to make Georgian windows, they cut through the window openings. You can actually see the saw marks. So you've got like two layers of stone, and you can see the saw marks on that one. But at this one, they did something which, in retrospect, they must have thought, oh, why did we do that? What they did, right, here's the front wall, OK? And they thought, I know what we'll do. We'll make this easy. We'll build a wall there. And then when we've done that, we can just take that one down. <laughs> if you go downstairs and look, you'll see this beam I've told you about. 
and you'll see it's stopped short of the wall. <laughs> well, when they took it down, they must have gone. Oh, uh, yeah, it was a sort of right said Fred moment, I should think. <laughs> and, and this is where you can see how they've had to sort of bring this, these, these, sash, uh, these uh, sash boxes and shutters are enormously deep because they're trying to fill up the gap. So they said, oh, no, we'll snap this corner seat. And they snapped a big corner It's been altered. As you can see, mm. I think this is not, it's not helped the building and it's kind of shifted a bit. Um, some of it if is you go downstairs is and wood. You'll see, sorry? Some of it's wooden. Yes, some yeah. of it is, yes. It's been altered and, and repaired over the years. But as we go through the drawer, you'll see there's this um, a metal column like holding up the wrist and a distinct gap of it. There must have been panic stations. <laughs> <laughs> that's why they did that. Um, that's what they did. There's lots of other 17th century bits. Yes, I must have picked them all up. Now, Elliot got touched me, said, I found some wallpaper. We were waiting to have a proper expert look at this because there's, no one's quite sure of the date of this. I mean, I thought it could be, this was stuck on boards. It's very, very thin paper. Um, something looks different, but then we saw a photograph. This is from the uh, Bath Preservation Trust. Has he been? Not yet. No, I'll mm. chase him. He's been away. Yeah. Um, uh, his impression was um, late 17th, early 18th century paper because this is a tulip. Mm. Mm. And um, tulips, it's now thought that, you know, this great tulip thing, more than money being lost, is mm. a bit of an exaggeration. Mm. But tulips went right on being enormously fashionable. The colour palette is quite small. The paper is very thin. I think Adrian doesn't. That's the planning conservation officer. He, he's not convinced by is by it. Is he? I mean, well, he's not convinced because um, it's on pine and. Um, he doesn't think there was much pine here at that time, but as Kirsten no, 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 pointed out, they were, they were, they were um, bringing deal into Bristol Docks, which is the they same were thing. Deal, yes, they were bringing deal into Bristol Docks quite early. I mean, I did check it out. So we really need someone to, to look at this, and you've got some more bits. And it would make sense with an Austrian physician that, mm. that he might have brought things in from Europe. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this is... It may not look very exciting, but trust me, we're nearly so many pictures. And I look at, I've got a book on, oh, that's, um, I, I went to contact this chap. This was on a different course I went on at the World and Down Museum. And he's, he was the world, I say was, well, so you guess what's coming, a uh, world expert on old wallpapers. A lovely, lovely man. So unseen. But sadly, he died quite young. Um, Otherwise, I could have sent pictures to you and said, true, what do you think? Um, so that's, that's really very sad. So we are quite excited about this. It may look like an extremely mm -hmm. uninteresting um, piece of paper. <laughs> because if that is, if we are right, then that's probably one of the oldest pieces of wallpaper in this country. <laughs> so you can see why we're excited about it. <laughs> but it's like when you look at a, a, a bird that you don't see very well, or you might think, oh, is it, is it something really rare? And you have to think, no, don't, don't. Do that. <laughs> so that's this one. Um, now, in 1728, it's taken over by John Billings. And John Billings is a vintner or wine merchant. It's possible because they often used a bunch of grapes as a sign. Mm -hmm. So it's very possible that's when it gets called the grapes. Um, by 1760, I think at that stage it was one, by 1760 it was back to being two buildings again. Um, but Robert Hayward, who's a monster, took the um, lease then and he converts it back to one building. Um, and it's licensed as a pub in 1776. Um, but it was still a wine merchant's, but it was described as very respectable. Um, in 1823, we have an advertisement for it. And I'll find the black one. This one. Now, uh, this was the following advertisement. Uh, the most eligible opportunity to be sold that capital free public house, free because it was free at any time or anything, or anything in connection with anything else, called the 
bunch of grapes, now in full trade, so a full license, situate in Westgate Street in the city of Bath, with a most convenient and compact beer and ale brewery. That may surprise you, but nearly every pub, big and small, brewed their own beer. If you go in the old green tree, and you go in the, through the sidebar and into the bar at the back, that was originally the brewery. Uh, and but of course, in Bath as well, there were enormously big breweries. There was the biggest brewery in the west of England. And at one point um, in the Georgian period, Bath was brewing more beer than Bristol. Not more beer per person, more beer. Because of all the visitors. So, at, uh, the Beer and Ale Brewery attached, fitted up with horse malt mill and horse pub and every apparatus for common brewing under the most approved principles, and which has been carried on for many years with considerable success. There is an excellent wine and spirit trade, so it was a pub, but it was still a wine merchant's. Combined with the retail business, which has been established as a public house of the first respectability for nearly 30 years, so we know that it was certainly uh, a pub in the 1790s. Um, I think this is, a, you know, I mean, not only is it because it's such a fascinating building, but it's kind of typical of what the sort of thing that did um, happen. Despite all that, and it being um, uh, uh, supposedly respectable, it was in the 1820s on the list of, of pubs that the police wanted to close down <laughs> uh, for slightly uh, rough behaviour. Um, and that it was constantly being altered. And in 1832, you can see it had a nice bow-fronted window. So you had a shop here, so I presume this is the wine shop. And um, you've got the bar, uh, kitchen, parlour, and the tap room. So for people who want to just, uh, you know, it probably would have been used as a tap room as well. Um, and it, you can see, in 1832, it's back to being just half the building again. But the there was a map that I saw where the corridor that you came up, there was a horseshoe bar. So the corridor was part of the pub, which is why we got permission to put the double doors in, because historically it was all open. So, it, it, I mean, there was this constant changing, as you mm -hmm. can see. However, oh yes, in 1904, we've got a photograph of it from 1904. Um, unfortunately, you haven't got the ground level. We've got this amazing you'll notice that these columns are the three classic orders of architecture. John Wood would have known this building. So is it this building that inspired him to use them on the circus? He knows it works. But here's the pub here, and what a wonderful inside. Now the bracket is still the bracket that's there. I know it's not very clear in this picture. I promise you it is, because I've looked really hard at close up it. And it was a huge and amazing and wonderful bunch of grapes. <laughs> Which, uh, if anybody knows any good wood carvers, I'd quite like to get rid of the clip art out the front. <laughs> 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 and the Bath Preservation Trust, because it doesn't like the fake ghost sign. Um, so um, they have got this amazing uh, bunch of grapes. Um, so it's like a bit of a ghost sign. But incredibly, in the 1930s, they decided they were going to widen Westgate Street. Oh. Uh, and this building was going for shit with the demolition. Oh. Um, fortunately, there, <laughs> there, was, there were some objections, and people thought, but this is such a wonderful building. And so in 1937, they did uh, finally save it, and it's still here today. <laughs> I'm just going to end very quickly. Um, Walcott Street, if you just want, one of the reasons, I think Walcott Street is a good example of one of the reasons why you can't possibly, I couldn't possibly done all the pubs. Because if you'd done a, a pub call at Walcott Street at one time, I doubt you'd have made it to the end of the street. <laughs> Let alone into London Street. <laughs> I mean, there are ones almost everywhere. There's Cooper's was the hand and shears, and before that, Oh, there's the Saracen's Head, of course. Um, there was another one. The one that's the cheese shop was the Jolly Sailor. Mm -hmm. The one that's got corn market on was another in, another one next. You get the picture. <laughs> um, but one of my wanted 
dimension was across another wide wall. So you know the wonderful building with Kurt in front of Kurt's Inwood? Yeah. Kurt's Inwood, because opposite was the entrance of the bell. And so if you're coming around with these rather cumbersome, what they call caravans, cars, it needs a space to turn. Um, it's very popular with historians of darts because they have a very peculiar darts board, which nobody has ever managed to, it must have been like a very local darts board. But I have to say that um, in 1903, isn't it, Mr. Emu, you followed us the study of all the pubs. Yeah. Yes. Um, and he was a bit concerned about the Walcott wine balls because uh, there was no ladies, of course. To get to the gents, you had to go down through a trap door under the bar. So, <laughs> 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 so very, 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 very,